Today, our guest is the studio director at Polygraph, and she is joining us live from Brooklyn. Welcome, Caitlin Ralph. It's such an honor to have you on Remote Daily. Caitlin, whenever I talk about your work and your job, I have to smile because I never met someone whose company is called The Pudding. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just unique. And I learned from you preparing for the session, it comes from the proof is in The Pudding, from this proverb. But what is the proverb all about? Yeah, definitely. Actually, I'm going to start with just like a funny anecdote where the name came from. So actually, originally, the company was just Polygraph, which is now our client facing end, which is actually not because of the lie detector. It's because of poly, like the prefix multiple graph, because each of our projects had multiple charts and multiple graphs. In 2017, when it split off, they had to name the editorial publication. They originally wanted to call it the proof because of the proverb, the proof is in the pudding. Um, the proof is in the pudding. And the reason they couldn't was because of copyright. Someone had the proof oh. already. So they jokingly started to call it the pudding and thought it was a terrible name. And when I say they, I mean Russell, Matt, and Ilya, who started the pudding. They thought it was terrible. It was a joke. But it was one of those things that it stuck. <laughs> and now it is the name of the publication. And I think, wow. honestly, as the pudding has grown over the years, it has grown into that more jovial, more lighthearted theme. And I think we'll get into some of the contrast between maybe some lighthearted stories that we work with and some heavier stories and stories that combine them. But we do visual and data storytelling to speak to debates and culture. So I think the idea of the proof is in the pudding. I think of it as like when you're having a debate with someone, the proof, the evidence is in what you are tangibly showing as your evidence in the debate, in the conversation that you're having. And Got that's it. like what our articles are, the proof in those debates, in those conversations. I'm sharing my screen here because just as a way of showing pudding.cool and how sophisticated this website is, whenever I reload the page, I see a different expression or different definition of what your company actually is. How is that possible? Yeah, definitely. There are a few things happening here, a few layers below the scenes that I'll talk about in a second. But what you're seeing right now is it's actually run from a database. Each of the members of the team actually chose their favorite articles. And so we paired each of these different phrases, which again, I'll get to in a second, with the makers or the journalist engineers' favorite articles. So if you actually scroll a little bit, it'll be it'll say, by Caitlin Ralph, by Kevin Lippman Navarro, journalist engineer on The Pudding. And so that's actually what you're seeing here. But the reason that we're swapping out those phrases is that we've always notoriously had issues describing what The Pudding does. Trying to tell my parents or trying to tell my friends, you just have to see what we do. And because of that, we've used a lot of different phrases over the years. Makes awesome stories with data, makes cool things on the internet, makes visual essays in culture. And that's because we've actually leaned into this kind of lack of definition over time. We do everything. We'll go into, obviously, feel like some projects. We do everything from very straight, straightforward pieces of journalism, editorial, yes. data journalism, to quizzes, to, to interactive pieces, to maps. It's all over the place now. So it represents the wide breadth of, of what we do. I'll stop you here and just show you around a little bit. So this is just a story about that visualizes stand-up comedy with the example of Ali Wong, who you might know from Netflix, just a, I think a special recently came out. And you clustered and identified the laughter across the entire show. And then from started to analyze how the entire show and therefore stand-up comedy is being built. So this is just yeah. one example for a beautiful data-driven visual story that you create on a daily basis with your team. I was absolutely fascinated because you learn something. And at the same time, you just, it's not reading. You really just enjoy looking at it. And a story I would like to dive in with you is what I also found absolutely fascinating, women's pockets. So this is uh, one of your most award-winning and also most famous stories. What is this all about? Yeah, definitely. I might actually touch on some of the pockets and also some of the skin of comedy piece because there are a lot of interesting things about both of these that are is somewhat related. Um, the pockets piece for is a great representation of what we do both from a process standpoint and also from an output standpoint. Process-wise, the idea for the article, for the project, for the visual essay, whatever you want to call it, started between a conversation between Jan and Amber. We were actually doing a remote retreat, or we were not a remote retreat, an in-person retreat. 
And they were having a conversation. They couldn't fit things in their pockets. They were talking about women's pockets. Particularly a few years ago, this was a big internet conversation, almost like a joke, almost like a meme sometimes. But what they actually decided to do, that was something debated in culture, which is our tagline. They actually decided to create a database of men and women's pockets. They went into dressing rooms of different clothing stores, measured the pockets, created this database to actually once and for all show that women's pockets are significantly smaller on average than men's pockets. And even though this is fun, again, at the time, especially, this was a big kind of internet joke conversation. But there's actually a lot of commentary, both in the text and also implicitly as well, around gender disparities in how items and clothing and things are marketed to women, quote unquote women versus quote unquote men, and what that means for the things like the purse industry. And you can also take it a level higher as well. So there are a lot of components here. The fact that we created a database, the fact that the article itself started by a conversation, which is how most of our articles start. But then also it's presented in this accessible way, this visual, fun, and exciting way, but you're really taking away that larger concept from the article itself. Yes, it is fascinating. And I'm not going to stop here. I'm actually going to jump into what got the excitement about the putting uh, started way back when. I remember yeah. when this really was the talk of the internet for a couple of days or even weeks. This mm -hmm. was the very first story, if I'm correct, that your founder, one of your founders created while on leave or while on sabbatical. Yeah, yeah. This is going all the way back in 2015. We actually redid it in 2018. So this is a slightly newer version, but the original piece looked very similar in 2015. And Matt Daniels, who originally founded Polygraph in 2015, 2016, was on sabbatical from his consulting job. He was, I was just telling someone very suit and tie consulting for about 10 years. Went on sabbatical, taught himself how to code. He loved rap music and hip hop music and created this visual. And to Felix's point, it went, and actually, if you go to Matt's bio on The Pudding, we all have these kind of lighthearted and fun bios on the website. He talks about this piece that tasted viral and internet fame and has almost been chasing it since then. And essentially, when this did so well, Matt started to get approached by different companies to do this kind of work for them. And at the time, and I know this is a topic we'll touch on later, at the time, this was unseen. This is a pretty familiar format. People are seeing this much more often now. Go, but going back now seven years, this was just starting to happen in the New York Times and The Guardian, who really are the pioneers of this type of visual journalism work, uh, but more in breaking newsroom space. This was a very fun, almost feature-like piece. Um, and yeah, and it really was the genesis for the entire company itself. He actually wrote, we should definitely share this afterwards, he wrote a Medium blog post at the time called The Journalist mm -hmm. Engineer which talked about really was my Magna Carta, if you will, for like my entire, I was in school at the time when it was published for my entire career. And it talked about this idea that you can be a journalist, but also an engineer and a coder and a developer at the same time, which again, in 2015 was a foreign concept. So yes, that was where it all started. <laughs> Unheard of. And and you just mentioned something that's, I think, really new to the profession in of media, of journalism. The, the, it's storytelling and coding. I think everybody who works on your team has to be able to tell stories and code, which is, as you said, is it, that's very new. That hasn't existed in the world of, of journalism before. What is harder to learn, though? Mm. Oh, I love that question. So to weave in a little bit of my own background, I was Matt Daniels, who I was just talking about, the founder of Polygraph. I was like his apprentice, his mentee for about three months. I moved to New York. And I shadowed him for three months straight and really learned his craft and something, one of the original pieces that he taught me, and this is coming from someone who also didn't have a background in developing. You can really teach people to code. It's actually hmm. not easy, but there are a lot of tools. There are a lot of things you can, I'll say it's maybe straightforward to learn how to code. It's not necessarily an easy task, but hmm. he always believed that the intuition behind storytelling and knowing how to tell a good story was actually much more harder to um, become an expert in than actually learning how to code. And that was something that really stuck with me considering I actually was going to school from computer science, but I was always drawn to some more, I was doing journalism since I was a kid, like in middle school, working on papers and newspapers. I was always drawn to that aspect of storytelling, even though I was in class being taught actually how to code. Definitely the storytelling, the short answer. Very interesting. Uh, we'll look at uh, one last story here that's uh, the, one of the most recent on the putting, and then we come to your uh, question for everyone in the audience today. And this one is about 
allergies. Please tell us more, Caitlin, why you decided on this story and what was what the outcome was. Yeah, this is one of our most recent ones. And again, very similar where I started with the women's pockets piece. I, I love where this story started. Russell, who's represented in his little eight-bit form on the left, my coworker, and also just in general, one of my closest friends, his newborn had a lot of food allergies and no one, him, his wife, no one in his family had ever dealt with food allergies before. So we had a newborn with all, with these particularly sesame allergies and he was learning all about it and he didn't realize how significant this space and this was. And so might be obvious to you if you have food allergies, but unfortunately, when you don't actually encounter these things on the daily, you don't really think about it. And this piece was trying to uncover that for people like myself, who had never really dealt with anyone or herself that had food allergies. So really, again, loved where the topic came from here. It speaks to a lot about how we set up the pudding as a publication. It's very different than other newsrooms in terms of how you pitch ideas and articles. But as you can also see, the way that we've actually visualized this story is extremely, in my opinion, innovative. It's this idea of it video game that you're walking through and actually being told the story. Mm -hmm. And even though it's not completely obvious, the story, and not every one of our articles necessarily are based in a data set or data. There are some that are just more visual storytelling, but this actually does have a data set and it is backed by data that they actually built as well. They created a database of crackers, like food crackers from different food markets and um, actually called manufacturers to understand how they actually um, dealt with food allergies, if it was made in a similar factory and things like that. So even though it's presented in this really, once again, accessible way, it's drawing you in, but it's really giving you this higher level concept and facts that's quite serious. And once again, this is... Um, it is backed by like a data set that we created. So yeah, I thought this was a really great example of Again, innovation and in how we're looking to take the pudding in the next, which is our fifth anniversary this year, so in the next five years. And kudos also to how you visualize it in, in the layout, the graphics. Uh, I think they're perfectly geared at today's parent, young parents' generation because they all grew up with point-and-click adventures from a small cartridge discs that were still put into uh, yep. <laughs> desktop computers. And this is exactly how it looked like when my generation was little. And I think this is the perfect way of visualizing it in a with an emotion of, oh, I, I know what this is. I know what this is talking to. So congratulations. And also for the important work that you're doing and come across in a light and fun way is such such a huge achievement. How do I actually find great stuff to read on the internet? There is, of course, always looking for information, for help, for, for support on, on, on life's biggest issues. There's always escapism. There's always culture. But how, like, how do you do it? How do you find great stuff like the one you just shared in the chat, which is, and I think, an overview of, of the entire year of 2020, uh, 2021 in music? How do you find that stuff? Do you have a secret source or a secret sauce for us? Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I actually, and you'll see that only my LinkedIn and my email was sent to the channel. I'm actually quite, I don't do really a lot of social media in general outside of my job. Mm -hmm. And so personally, this is a little bit of a personal answer, but a lot of it is from people I know who are a little bit more entrenched in the internet. But I am quite conscious also because of my role and my job that I do, I'm quite conscious of, I, set up, I try to set up a decent amount of filters for what I'm consuming on the daily. And I, that's easier said than done, but I am not the person personally that is scrolling through Twitter every day and reading every link I see. Mm. It's usually curated from people I trust and know, whether it's my coworkers like that. that it's actually, I don't want to get too much into what observable is the piece that I had sent, but that was sent from Matt, my coworker. And he actually was like, I want to see this for your own music. And I did do it for my own music. And I thought it was really, <laughs> interesting cool for many reasons i'm not going to get into it but also my friends as well a lot of them working journalism and media and they'll send me things and i'll go from there so i'm actually very lucky with the people i surround myself with and they are often mm -hmm. sending me things that they find i personally don't spend a lot of time again on the twitterverse or something like that looking at every link i possibly can interesting because you're shaping the new world of media and the new world of journalism but you're also staying away from a huge part of it that's fascinating and what you just shared here and you said ah, i don't really want to talk about it now that's <laughs> out there in the world i'm, I'm still going to share it because everyone this link that caitlin shared with all of us here through the zoom chat from a platform called observable actually lets you connect 
with your personal Spotify account and then shows what exactly. So Observable, it was created by Mike Bostock, who used to be at the New York Times. And he was one of the original practitioners of data and visual journalism. He made a lot of the original graphics at the New York Times in 2015-ish, mm -hmm. did a lot of talks. He left the New York Times and created Observable, which is a platform where you can code a language called Data Driven Documents, D3. It's a JavaScript library that is the library people use to actually visualize charts and data. Part of Observable is not only can you code this language and you can see it happening this in this graphic, like they're making a scatter plot, you can actually host your own coded and people coded languages and like little notebooks and the like Jupyter notebooks or our notebooks that people can find. Sahil, who made this piece, used to be at the New York Times. I think he's now back in school. He is a friend of the Pudding and Polygraph for a few years now. And while you can't connect your own, you can download this code. You can request all of your own personal data from Spotify. And I spent about a day tinkering it and matching his code with mine. So it did take a few hours to do, particularly because I don't code a lot anymore. But what I thought was brilliant about it is that I personally think it's a more representative version of Spotify wrapped than the actual Spotify wrapped. Sorry, Spotify. Because it served as a diary of your music from the entire year on a daily basis. So if you're a big music person like me, oh. music really defined particularly is defined every year. But I can find moments where I was walking around London in 2021 mm -hmm. and I was listening to the same artists on repeat and I can actually see that and remember that moment. So I, this was really special for me. Again, I did it with my own music and I think this is a really interesting representation. There's no story, there's no text to it, but you personally know the story. And I sat with my friends and told mm -hmm. them the entire story of my year based on, but to link your previous question, what am I consuming as someone who's shaping this? Again, I'm being pretty tactical with what I'm consuming every day because I don't want to become oversaturated. I don't want to mm -hmm. be consuming a million things and not even be able to think about it. I want to sit with particular pieces, which is why I filter based on people around me who I trust. But another aspect of it is that I spend a lot of time also in the content marketing world, people who want to integrate visual and data storytelling, people as in companies and brands and organizations. So I'm constantly thinking about things like Spotify Wrapped, which is one of the, maybe the most popularized version of content marketing based in data from the past few years. And the fact that I found this piece on Observable sent to me by someone, and I think it's actually a better version of that. These are the things I'm thinking about every day, because like, how can I make a better version of Spotify Unwrapped mm -hmm. for some of the companies and organizations I'm working with? Before we look at the things that you do paid for other organizations, there's one a piece we're going to look at for the Washington Post. You just said something that I found really surprising, because in a lot of jobs today, there's a notion that you have to be on social media. You have to be visible on LinkedIn. You have to be as a, maybe a marketing person, you have to be visible on SoundCloud or Spotify and be really active there on YouTube with the community as, a, as an artist. You have to be on Twitter as a um, media person. So there's this notion, if you're not in, engaging there, you don't even exist. And you're clearly going against that while still working in that same realm. How is that possible? I personally, this is a really interesting thread. I don't talk about it a ton, but I think I create a lot more space for myself to think. <laughs> um, the amount of time I see other people around me, and this is not, I think this is pretty known fact, but the amount of time they spend scrolling through TikTok or Twitter, and again, being over-consumed with information, I don't think you give yourself the time to actually sit with pieces and think about things a little bit more deeply. And that's personally what I prefer to do. Again, I have, people can find me on the Puddings website. I, I have my own presence there, but I've always, and I think we can say this both in terms of the Puddings work and polygraph work, I think it applies. It's, it's a very simple phrase and it's quality over quantity in my opinion. And that's mm -hmm. essentially how I run my own information consumption, but also the strategy behind the type of work that we're making at Polygraph and Pudding. I'd rather sit with a piece like our Washington Post piece for maybe a half an hour rather than maybe consuming 15 articles in that time. So that's just how I approach it. I, my coworker, Matt, on the other hand, I bet he consumes, and maybe my other coworker, Ilya, probably hundreds of articles a day and that works for them. So I think you just have to find what works for you. I'm much more interested in studying the craft on a deeper level. And that's probably because I did my degree in computer science and I did my master's in data visualization. So I was used to approaching these things from a pretty academic approach and detailed approach, <laughs> maybe too detailed. Oh, but I honestly, I, 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 think, I think you're sending a really important message 
by saying, hey, you can still work in this world of digital creation and storytelling and coding without consuming it the entire time. You can still create meaningful or even even more meaningful things for your fellow humans by not consuming what everybody else is doing the entire time. So just let it let that sit there <laughs> uh, for a moment. And of course, what keeps the lights on at, at Polygraph and, and the putting is you are creating these huge pieces for companies all around the world and for media outlets all around the world. And it's just one thing that really struck me as very powerful and us when we looked at this that I wanted to briefly share here. I'm not a Washington Post subscriber. The website now looks a little bit different than for people who are subscribed to the Post. But still, you can easily see that you did something there that shows this story in a way that it is nowhere else being seen. How did you do this and why did you do this? Yeah, definitely. There is actually a case study on Polygraph's website that breaks down some of the technical as well. So I'll share, can share that with you all afterwards if you're not a Washington Post subscriber. But I, I first want to take a step back and actually talk a little bit about the mechanics and the nuts and bolts of this, because I think it's a really amazing representation of how Polygraph operates in the client world. So one of our longest clients is the Google News Initiative, which is part of Google. It's run by Simon Rogers. He used to be at The Guardian. He actually coined the modern term data journalism. And in my opinion, one of the most important figures in the field in modern history. He is now the data editor at Google Trends. And again, he's been our client for many years now. And he commissions pieces from, there we go. That's exactly this case study. He commissions pieces from Polygraph that mirror what we do at The Pudding, visual essays, and just using mostly Google data. This was a particularly interesting manifestation of that because it was a collaboration between Google News Initiative and the Washington Post and Polygraph. We actually received a byline as the pudding on the article. So Google News, News Initiative funded Polygraph to actually staff this project with the Washington Post. Matt from our team collected all of the data. It was an extremely intensive data process, one of the most intensive data collection processes I've ever seen on our team. He watched hours and hours and hours of these videos across different platforms. It wasn't actually only YouTube and Google. It was also Facebook Live, if I'm correct as well. And then he paired with our developer, Amelia Wattenberger, one of the most important figures in dashboard and D3 and JavaScript coding. If you are familiar in that world, you're most likely familiar with Amelia. She did actually the development paired with someone at the Washington Post, but she led a lot of the development. This came out, I'm pretty sure, Felix, I think it was September, October 2021. So it was a few months after the wave of Black Lives Matter protests in the summer. And this particularly focused on the first week of protests in reaction to George Floyd in Minneapolis. And it essentially wanted to, again, this was a few months on, so it was a little bit more looking back on this moment. It wanted to visually show the protests actually using the, the video that people were taking. This was a data set, again, going back to Matt's collection, that had never been compiled before, but it was out there on the internet. And it was able to, again, going back to my point, visually show what was mm -hmm. happening in that week. And I think this is a really amazing example of using data, and in, in, in this case, in terms of video. It, the feeling that you get from reading this article is amazing. And I think it just really goes against this idea of numbers and data. It's cold. Right. This is couldn't be more opposite. And it actually goes back to Matt's original mantra in 2015 in his journalist engineer blog post. I was talking about this concept of, you can read a 10,000 word article. Some people are beautiful writers and those articles are amazing to sit down and read on a Sunday. But I do think the emotion and feeling that this article does visually um, is miles ahead in terms of the emotion that it gives to the reader and the understanding and the perspective that they wouldn't get. So one of my favorite pieces just on that impact point, but also again, the mechanics in the background of how we ended up partnering with Google and how the actual piece was funded. And we worked with the Washington Post with the newsroom directly. Yeah. One of my favorite pieces, really proud. Congratulations. You, yeah, you really, you really represent the future of work in, in journalism in, in, in so many ways, also through a collaboration like this, which a few days, a few years ago would have been like, meh, can't do this. Now it's, it's every day, <laughs> all day. And you were one of the first to do this. And this brings me also to now I have to put you on the spot. What's next? Like, what, of course, you, we don't want you to <laughs> dive into having to consume 
everything that's going on and then answer this question just from your gut feeling and from what you and your colleagues discuss every day. Where do you see the trajectory of your profession going? What is the next generation of storytellers doing already that we as the consumers don't even see yet? Yeah, I have a few thoughts related to this. And it does go back to our original conversation, Felix, but we actually had a in-person um, meetup, a data visualization community meetup about a week or two ago, which was really amazing. And I was really grateful for it. And this topic came up actually a decent amount. And I talked to some people and it did some of it did change my perspective a little bit. So the premise of my point of view on this in terms of the future and innovation, it's something I have to think about, particularly on the company and the business side of Polygraph is that I think over the past two or three years, a lot due to COVID-19, the pandemic, and how that news was being translated, I think the general population got a lot more familiar with consuming their news through visualizations and data. And when I say that in connection to the pandemic, maps and charts, that's how we were consuming caseloads and where cases were on the daily. Everyone was at one point. Um, and I think that what that's created is that these things are not as unfamiliar to the general population. So I think before places like the pudding and polygraph, we were really surprising people with this type of storytelling. I think nowadays it's a little less surprising. So I think we are battling a little bit of what is next and how we do keep this surprising and interesting. Um, but I think a really interesting and I, the reason why I brought up the meetup is I had a conversation with some about this and they were arguing, yes, that's true. But they are actually unsure that people are taking away the takeaways that maybe you're supposed to or need to from these. And maybe they're consuming charts and maps a little bit blindly. So I think there is actually, and I did agree with that point, I think there's a lot of work that can be done on data literacy and how you actually connect charts and maps and things you're seeing with actual changes in your own life and maybe changes that we want to influence policy and things like that. So I thought that was a really interesting call out when I was having this conversation that um Maybe they're familiar with seeing it and the general population is familiar with seeing it, but maybe there is maybe a little bit of gap in terms of data literacy that we can work mm -hmm. on. And I think actually places like the pudding can really plug into that because it's not as sterile as maybe a New York Times map or something like that. It's again, going back to the Sesame piece, the Women's Pockets piece, it's a really welcoming, inaccessible place. I'll get texts from my friends who are like, my parents found your music quiz and they're doing it right now and they're like 70 years old and they're really enjoying it and loving it. So I think it's actually maybe a place where we can really work on data literacy and getting more people familiar with telling stories in this way in a more safer place than maybe reading the New York Times about the pandemic or something. Um, so the future for storytellers is less discovering when using more and more technology. It's actually more about helping the people that are, are the audience to understand and use and um, maybe interact with that technology in the future. Yeah, I think it goes down. Yeah, I think it also goes back to your question of what's more difficult to teach someone to code or be a right. storyteller. And I think it's more difficult and I agree with Matt when he was teaching me that in 2017, I think it is more difficult to mm -hmm. be a storyteller at the end of the day. And I think it connects back to all the things we were talking about, again that concept of quality over yes. quality and what the practitioners themselves are consuming and how they're inputting that into like the work. I think we need to increase our level of depth and our thought and mm -hmm. our study of these things, especially as practitioners when we're making it. And also having a diverse kind of like array of interests and hobbies that are maybe separate from what you're doing every day, because I think it does influence this type of work as well. And, and referring yeah. to Anne's comment here in the chat, who says that data literacy is going to become more and more important for every single industry. Thank you, Caitlin, for helping us see that and see through that. Is there a place for everyone who is maybe listening now to go already to maybe learn how to do what you just said? Is there a place that you recommend? Or would you say, we have a 10 articles on the putting already about this. Just check <laughs> those out. What what's what what would you where would you send us if we want us if we want to be more data literate? Yeah, I this sounds terrible, but I truly do think the pudding. I think it is a great place to start. I, I'm supposed to be passionate about where I work. And I truly do think the pudding is a great place, not only because of the actual articles, and we have hundreds of articles on the site at this point that cover everything from politics to culture to music. And then on um and then if you go to like our we have a blog post how to section, it actually breaks down like how we make these things and how we think about these things. And we have a series of three blog posts that takes it from story, idea, data. So it actually pulls back the curtain and how we do things. 
Another really important part of the pudding as well is everything is public. There is no subscribers. We don't track ads. There's no ads. There's no page clicks and anything like that. And not only are the articles themselves free and public to read, but also all the data and code behind it is on our GitHub. So people who do want to maybe go to the next level and start poking on their own can actually go to our GitHub page. Everything from like our starter template, that's a very technical term, but like the actual code framework that that creates our articles is all public, but also, again, all the individual code for every article and all the data that we collect and create and clean is also up for people to use as well. So I think it's catering to people who are really just on the tip of the iceberg with understanding data and charging visuals by just consuming the articles themselves. But we also have a lot of resources there for people who want to actually learn it themselves. And I think I just found uh, the link, I'm putting it here in the chat, pudding.cool slash resources is where you publish pretty much everything you work with your entire toolbox even the code is out there and of course there's also a lot of ways to to interact to engage and to figure out together what's next it is such an inspiration to spend time in your world so thank you caitlin for taking the time to put us on this journey today that took us really from um women's pockets all the way to <laughs> The Washington Post and an incredible work over months and months to help us understand what if the uh, the biggest events um, of the last two years. And this is what you do every day. And kudos to you and your team. And I guess what we always ask is really important in that sense. How can how can we as a community support you, Caitlin? How can we support you in what you're? You can follow the pudding on Instagram. We started our TikTok two days ago, so okay. I'm not a TikTok person, but you could go and follow our TikTok and we're making some really fun TikToks and videos of our articles. Really excited about that personally, but Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, go and follow the pudding. Everything is free and open. We have a newsletter. Definitely sign up for that. And then if you are interested, you can also become a Patreon. Our Patreon supports directly our freelance articles on the pudding because we want to tell as diverse of an array of stories from all different backgrounds and people from around the world. So we work with a lot of freelancers and mm -hmm. a lot of our Patreon goes to fund um, freelance articles. And we have like special stickers, t-shirts, and behind the scenes stuff of a Slack channel, Friends of the Pudding that you can join on our Patreon. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> fantastic. So even if you have a, even if you follow your own advice and have a very limited social media <laughs> diet, make the pudding part Please. of it. And I guess this is also the moment to thank you and just uh, spread out your our arms in your direction and give you a little bit of virtual glitter from the entire remote daily community, uh, wherever thank you are you. in the world. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks, Caitlin, for being on the show today. And uh, Caitlin, before we end with our mini concert today, we always give the mic back to our guests. What is the last thing you would like to share with us? What is your final message for our community? Oh my gosh, everyone, it's Friday. I hope you have a nice, lovely, restful weekend and take some time for yourself. And and even if it's five minutes or it's two hours, please take some time for yourself and recruit and have a restful weekend. That's what I have to say. Yes, retweet that. I wish you all a good weekend, Felix. Bye-bye. <laughs>